Okay, well, uh, welcome and thank you very much for uh, for joining us today to um, uh, to hear uh, a short presentation and then we're going to have a Q&A uh, panel discussion. Uh, the theme for today is around uh, remote research, testing, evaluations and also uh, workshops. So we'll be discussing, uh, introducing and then discussing uh, all of those uh, throughout uh, the next hour. Um, the, uh, I guess the image on the right is the kind of unwelcome guest to all of this. Um, so, um, you know, the current situation that has uh, forced uh, lots of remote working uh, to everyone. Um, and indeed, I think it's perspective that we were quite ready for already. We took, we took the choice at Bunnyfoot to, uh, to go all remote um, about a week before the uh, the lockdown happened, um, we do lots of remote work anyway. But we just wanted to make sure that we were we were ready for that. We had all of our processes uh, going, and indeed, we communicated to our clients that um, this is probably going to be um, the way forward. Um, so, what we found during that phase was uh, a number of our clients uh, perhaps weren't used to doing uh, remote, didn't understand what um, the benefits um of remote could be and indeed what you could do with remote so we thought we'd uh we'd have this session just a brief introduction to the basics of of remote research and also you know other remote activities and uh, then we'd open up a q a so that um that you guys can can ask us any questions and uh and also um you know open up the forum so you can make comments as well about your own uh, perspectives uh, on remote working remote research etc so uh, this is our agenda we're due to uh, finish at uh, 14 30. um we're delighted uh today to be uh joined by Haley isaac from uh, hsbc uh, she's the research ops manager there um, she has to juggle a whole host of uh, internal research uh, nationally and internationally uh, and we've been working uh, closely with Haley for uh, the past 18 months or so um, so she's got some great perspectives on not only the kind of work that, that, that we do with her but but kind of broader uh, research as well and indeed um, you know how things are um, shaping up uh, at HSBC um, we were due to be joined by uh, Martin from uh, Sheffield City Council to talk about um, the uh, the ways that they're working as well. Unfortunately, at the last minute, he's been un unable to attend. Um, so there will just be uh, the four of us uh, in the panel. Um, there's myself, I should introduce myself. Uh, I'm John Dodd, I'm the founder and MD of Bunnyfoot. And you'll see, and you can see um, uh, our videos here. Uh, there's Pete, who's a senior consultant, uh, and also Amy, who's a lead consultant uh, at Bunnyfoot, and we'll be kind of passing the baton between each other for the first half hour or so, uh, and then opening out to to Haley, and then also asking you for your uh, your questions. Um, so, getting on to you, that's us. Getting on to you, um, we had and um, we've got currently 122 people uh, attending, which is great. Um, and we've got representatives from uh, over 90 companies. So this is just a random sample. We couldn't get all the, um, the logos on there. So if your logo isn't there, I do apologize, but um, it, it was just a kind of random sampling. Um, normally when we run these, uh, these types of seminars, we do them face-to-face -face, uh, in London and we encourage a lot of uh, networking. So we know that you can learn a lot rather than just us kind of broadcasting at you from asking questions of each other, sharing experiences, et cetera. Um, for this first uh, online kind of remote one webinar, um, we're not doing that, we're just um, launching the Q&A. Um, but if there's appetite to have more interaction and a kind of uh, curated uh, networking for future uh, user experience service design um, uh, sessions, then uh, we're happy to facilitate that uh, as well. So at, um, at the end of this, you'll be sent uh, a link to uh, a survey and we're going to be asking you some questions about uh, what you think your future needs might be for these kind of things. So we'll open those up in the future. But we're delighted so many people uh, can attend. I mean, one of the silver linings of this whole thing, of course, is that normally we run them uh, close to our London office. Um, however, um, some people can't make that just through sheer geography. So at least running these things online, some people haven't been able to attend our face-to-face -face ones. 
are now uh, being able to attend uh, these virtual ones. So um, there's always a silver lining with these things. Um, as I've said, um, it'd be good to have your um, your questions uh, coming in there. If you look to the, the right of your panel, you see there's a Q&A uh, tab. If you click on that, you can type in your questions there. And you can also upvote any questions that you think are worthy. So if someone's already asked your question, if you just want to uh, upload it. And then for the final uh, portion of the, uh, the seminar, we'll be uh, talking uh, through those. So please do make use of that. Uh, we want this to be, uh, you know, it's your session. So ask any questions uh, and you can also make comments and things in the chat as well. OK, just briefly, introduction to, to Bunnyfoot. Um, many of you know us already, but for those that uh, that don't or aren't familiar with us, um, we're a 40 strong team of specialists, uh, UX, service design, design consultants and research specialists. Uh, we've been going now for 20 years. Normally, we have offices in um, London, Oxford and Sheffield, but obviously we're uh, all working from home at the moment. So we're in uh, bedrooms and offices and sheds throughout the country at the moment, mainly centred around our offices. Um, the thing that we really uh, galvanise on is evidence driven design. So effectively feeding in research uh, and evidence and insight to enable the design process, to enable uh, design to really work. And I'll talk more about that um, shortly. But really, the theme of today's um, seminar is about how you can um, get that evidence in a remote way. So we'll be talking you uh, through those uh, those ways shortly. Uh, and we do it with a number of clients. And these are some of the clients we've been working with uh, and are working with over the, the last uh, couple of months or so. Um, we're part of a wider group. So we are the UX specialist and service design specialist company for uh, the Sideshow Group. Uh, and in combination with our sister companies, we have a full service offering. So um, what that allows us to do as Bunnyfoot is be even more polarized towards uh, research, user experience design and service design, rather than worrying about uh, development and branding and SEO because that's taken care by all of our uh, sister companies. So should you have a need for that, um, you can get that via those sources. Um, our kind of mantra, the overall envelope that governs everything we do is evidence-driven design. And really this boils down to having confidence to drive design forward and also keep the momentum. So, um, you know, evidence provides you with the ability to, uh, to make more informed decisions. So these could be big strategic ones or small tactical ones small conversion improvements or, you know, the, the, the whole um, business endeavour. So, uh, you know, evidence is key to all of this. And obviously it's intrinsic intrinsic with any user-centred design or customer-centric design. Um, and of course, it also gives you the momentum and it keeps that momentum. It engages with people and makes sure that everything is going forward based on what your ultimate uh, customers would need. So evidence-driven design is very much uh, the kind of mantra of, of what we offer. Um, and I think a really important thing of that is having um, two, um, you know, aligned disciplines. So this is really the evidence part and the design part. So we work with lots of organisations who have lots of research from various different sources. Um, and sometimes that research is very good. And sometimes it's not always the most appropriate thing to help with design. And that may be because um, the evidence has been gained or the research has been uh, been produced without a knowledge of the design environment or uh, or the design aims, or maybe the constraints, or the technical constraints, or any of those other aspects of design that will ultimately inform what is needed. Um, equally, um, you can get design that happens in uh, the vacuum of any evidence or research as well. So the whole point of evidence-driven design is providing or having that, that Venn diagram, if you like, of uh, evidence, research, and knowledge about design married to uh, you know uh, appreciation of research and evidence and incorporating that into design and when you get those two things right and those two things kind of singing together um, you know the the hope is that you produce high performance uh, products and service experiences and it doesn't really matter whether these are digital or live the same you know the same ethos um, lies around understanding the customer and knowing about the, uh, the design environment, about how you're going to service that as well. So blending those together is what it's all about. Um, you know, intrinsic in this is really um, now, because of, of um, uh, the coronavirus, 
Um, everything's kind of wholesale changed from what we would typically do, which would be uh, you know lots of lab based or lots of face to face types of testing. But now we've moved wholesale for obvious reasons to remote uh, research and testing. So we're just going to focus on those for the next uh, 20 minutes or so and then open out to uh, your questions. Well, we'll talk to Haley and then your, your questions. So um, a number of you will have attended the session that we ran last year when we talked about um, the differences between big data and little data. So mainly the differences between um, you know, quantitative data, maybe um, uh, obtained through you know, large scale uh, analytics, those types of processes, uh, and also uh, qualitative data. So uh, lab-based testing uh, and other types of, of research as well. Um, and in that, we showed that there's a whole kind of landscape. So this is one of the diagrams that we used. And we think it's a useful way of plotting out those different uh, research endeavors. Um, and I encourage you to, to look this one up. It's quite a well-known uh, diagram. Um, when you look at these, though, you'll see that um, you know, the majority of them are still uh, absolutely appropriate to, um, to produce and to, and to do uh, remotely. So um, although <clears throat> you know, some of the things that we uh, are doing now have to change, um, most of the research uh, endeavours are uh, appropriate and can be achieved, um, you know, sat in our remote offices and engaging with your customers uh, wherever they uh, may be as well. So, um, so it's still a useful and fruitful time. So everything hasn't stopped. Um, you can still do really successful research um, as long as you, uh, you know, have adapted appropriately. That's what we're going to be talking about soon. Um, another way of looking at this is the whole kind of spectrum of deployment method methods. So uh, on the left hand of the slide, you can see would be our traditional lab based testing. Obviously, the big X, we can't do any of that at the moment. Um, in the middle, the other thing that's been um, uh, you know, stopped is what we call mass or intercept testing. That's grabbing people off the street and doing short, sharp uh, interviews with them or short, sharp tests with them. Um, but we have recourse to these uh, these other um, uh, channels within that whole spectrum of testing. So remote moderated testing and interviews, um, you can do a variety. Uh, I've just listed some of the types of uh, research you can do there uh, using, you know, obvious screen sharing uh, technologies, that which we're now be becoming all accustomed to. Um, and also you can do remote unmoderated testing. There's a variety of different software platforms that allow you to do uh, a variety of different types of uh, inquiry, ranging from, you know, simple surveys, to uh, you know, complex uh, usability testing uh, and everything in between. Uh, and also, of course, on the right-hand side, you've got those uh, kind of bigger data things, things like analytics and also A-B testing. Um, there are um, you know, some benefits to doing remote research. And indeed, it's not just because of uh, the current situation that we do remote research. We do it as a matter of course anyway but we tend to mix it in with those other face-to-face -face, uh, endeavors as well. However, at the moment, of course, uh, we're forced to do remote research. So uh, what are the benefits of uh, doing that? Um, one is obvious one is increased geographic spread. Um, so we can reach people um, with remote techniques that uh, wouldn't be available to come to say our labs or where, wherever else we're doing uh, research face-to-face. Uh, um, also, at this time, we're getting uh, and we're seeing uh, an increased demographic spread as well. So uh, often we do lab testing during uh, office hours. When you do remote testing, you tend to be able to broaden that reach. And indeed, at the moment, you know, lots of people at home and are available to uh, be researched and doing testing with. So that's one of the benefits that we're seeing. Um, you also get more uh, flexible scheduling with that. Um, but perhaps the, the the greatest thing, and why we always use it as a matter of course, to, you know, um, notwithstanding the the current crisis, is it gives you um, a greater contextual relevance. So um, when people are using uh, the equipment they've been normally using to um, interact with your uh, your site or your service or your app or your software or whatever it is, um, they have recourse to all their normal uh, equipment that they're familiar with, any facilities, other people. Uh, you know, books, you know, anything else that they would normally have on hand. So it's less artificial in that mode. It's more contextually relevant. Um, also, when you're doing more exploratory types of research, you can uh, probe, you know, other 
kind of wider environmental factors. So this might be, you know, people, other people within their household or their office if they they happen to be in an office still. Um, but they can they can show you uh, aspects of their setup, their context, all of those kind of things. So it gives you um, a, a deeper window into you know what's called the context of use. Um, also, what we've found, um, particularly in the healthcare sector previously, but also uh, now as well, when we're talking about uh, aspects of the current crisis, is participants are more comfortable uh, often when um, the inquiry is remote to answer or discuss um, uh, more sensitive topics as well. So uh, those are some of uh, the benefits. Um, obviously, it presents some challenges as well. Um, more time is required simply to uh, to have the technical setup. Now, when we do this, we we have uh, prior calls to ensure with our technicians and also our our researchers that um, the the technical setup is going to work. Um, and in fact, obviously, what we've found is um, you know Zoom has almost become a noun now. People are, are very familiar now because they've been forced to over the last five weeks to start using this technology. So it's not a new thing anymore. So actually, if anything, the uh, the technical kind of barrier has decreased somewhat. We've we've kind of got over that um, because of the current situation. Um, it does require more effort to build a rapport. Obviously, when you're face to face, there's all sorts of different cues and things uh, that you can build on, and it's just you know uh, uh, you know more direct. Um, so you have to put in more effort to build that rapport. Have a good uh, researcher to participant uh, relationship and pick up on more of those uh, kind of body language cues. Um, you know, during research, um, there are more technical issues that can happen. You know, something simple like uh, someone's microphone not working, uh, internet issues, their son playing Fortnite, or whatever. You know, all of these things uh, do happen. So you have to, uh, you know, anticipate those things happening. And, you know, it's it's fine. You can cope with those as long as you anticipate those and just deal with them with, uh, with good humour. Uh, they will happen uh, and it's fine. We'll talk more about some of those uh, later on. Um, one of the things, though, is that um, some normal behaviours are potentially polarised because of this uh, current situation. You know, people are maybe more on edge. Uh, they're not behaving in an appropriate way because of the current situation. Um, you know, that can be taken into account somewhat. Uh, and actually, if you think about it, it's not really a silver lining, but one of the effects of this whole situation is that, um, to a certain extent, what is normal is likely to change in the future. Um, you know, we may have another session on this, but what is going to be the new normal for uh, customer experience in the future? Um, you know, more people are obviously shifting online to things like um, uh, supermarkets and everything else, whereas they might have been resistant in the past. So because they've been forced to now, lots of people are seeing the benefits of all of these and those thresholds have actually got over now. So actually a lot of remote working might, might now be the new norm. So the things that people are experiencing at the moment are likely to be more normal in the future. So um, potentially, although it's it seems strange at the moment, uh, it's likely to be you know the dawn of a new uh, period in the future. We can talk more about that maybe in the Q and A later on. Um, what I want to do now is just pass over quickly to uh, to Pete uh, to talk about specifically about uh, kind of interviews, remote testing, and also uh, diary studies. Thanks, John. Uh Thank you very much. OK, so we're going to take a deeper dive into these, into some of the techniques that uh, we can use for remote research to give you guys a better flavour of the types of pros and cons and reasons why you might want to uh, use these particular techniques to do your remote research. So if we start with interviews, so a research interview is effectively um, a conversation that you're going to have uh, with the participant. And as an interviewer, your job is basically to establish rapport with the participant, um, ask them a series of questions um, and listen actively so that you can ensure that you get the most value from the research and you can ask appropriate follow up questions. So in a nutshell, what you're doing is um, setting the context for the interview with the participant um, using your skills as an interviewer to encourage the flow of the conversation and making sure that you ask non-leading questions so you don't buy any bias any responses from the participant. In terms of what that might look like from a project perspective, um, what you would potentially be doing is conducting a, a series of um, brief, typically 20 to 30 minute discussions with your participants around a given topic. Um, you can choose to run this just through audio only. Um, 
because it just saves you on a bit of the technical overhead that you have to address during the project. But there is a, a useful addition that you can make to your interviews by screen sharing stuff with participants if you happen to uh, want to probe deeper into maybe some concepts that you have or identify any kind of or, or probe into any sort of particular participant behaviors. So it's always better to um, observe people's behaviors rather than ask them to report their own behaviors because it's uh, unlikely they're going to remember it correctly. So if you have anything you want to show them, then screen sharing is a great way to do that. And you can get um, natural responses to the stimulus. Um, in terms of why you'd want to do these types of interviews, well, you get a really great deep insight into what the customer's needs and motivations are. So you can get um, insights into pain points, attitudes, what the goals are, for example. And what you can use that information for is to build out models such as personas and experience maps and service design blueprints, which are really useful and effective tools for ongoing design work. So you do all your interviews, distill them into useful design tools and then progress with your, your research or your design activities. So just to give you guys a couple of example of um, what we've been doing recently, uh, interviews wise. So these are a couple of studies we've uh, run for clients in the last month. So we've done uh, one project where we were conducting 20 interviews for 30 minutes at a time um, over a space of three days to talk to people about what their needs are when they're booking a, a holiday online. And for another client, we conducted 30 20 minute interviews over the course of four days to talk to them about their coping mechanisms and what changes they've observed in their behavior as a result of being in lockdown. So it's just a couple of recent examples of how we can um, explore some really interesting current topics using interviews. So moving on to talking about usability or UX testing, which as John mentioned is something that we, we do uh, very regularly in a, in a lab based environment, um, it's equally suited to be done remotely. So in terms of what usability testing is, uh, it's typically longer sessions. So we're now talking sort of 30 to 60 minute mark when you're gonna be testing live websites or prototypes with your participants. And you will be uh, actively using screen share so the um, participants can navigate their way around uh, the site or the prototype you're using. Um, and you can see what they're doing, observe their behavior, and then understand uh, what um, usability issues are creeping in and follow up with any interesting probing questions or any contextual questions you might want to ask. So a couple of, uh, uh, or a few key reasons why you might want to do that. So first, as I mentioned, uncover any usability issues you might have with the website or prototype you're working with. You can use it on a repeat basis to um, test iterative uh, improvements that you're making. So if you're working to a sprint program, for example, um, you can uh, slot in user testing sessions at key milestones or end of a given sprint. It also is a, a great opportunity to look at uh, what the wider needs of your customers are. So for example, you might want to consider uh, benchmarking um, your competitors' products against your own. Again, this uh, remote usability testing is a great way to achieve that. And there are kind of two key strands that we've alluded to earlier in terms of how you might want to proceed with this type of testing. So you can either do it in a moderated fashion where a moderator will be um, working with the participant. And um, so uh, that's a really great um, approach to take if you want to ask questions to gain a really good in-depth understanding about any particular usability issues that you might be concerned about or that you might observe. Um, or if you need the, the moderator there to help um, explain certain aspects of the prototype or site that you're working with. So for example, if it's, if it's particularly complex or you need a participant to go down a particular journey, the moderator can help facilitate that. And, and you can get more um, um, sort of bang for your buck from the session. Conversely, you might want to go down the unmoderated route, which is typically where you're dealing with larger sample sizes, and you might have a, a specific set of targeted questions that you need answering that could be handled without the need for a moderator to be there. So again, just to give you a couple of recent examples that we've been working on in the last month. So from a moderator perspective, we've recently run a study with 10 participants um, over 60 minute sessions to look at issues that were impacting on conversion for a given retail site. Um, so that would be a classic um, type of project that we would do in a lab based setting. But we, as I said earlier, we can equally do that um, easily uh, via remote sessions. Um, from the unmoderated perspective, um, we recently did a study with including 140 participants which was looking at comparing uh, new checkout uh, designs uh, to an old checkout design to basically prove the business case for making the change to the new design. So really what the idea here was, was basically to give the decision makers more 
statistical confidence in the data that we we're producing to help inform the business decision. So just to give you guys a bit more detail about the difference between the two different types of um, usability testing. So when we're talking about moderated um, remote sessions, again, this is where a moderator would be speaking directly to the participants, building that initial rapport, asking some initial contextual questions, setting tasks, scenarios as appropriate and asking follow-up questions. All of that allows you to get that really in-depth qualitative feedback. Um, and because you're observing people's behaviors, you get really rich insight into the usability as issues um, of the um, prototype or website you're, you're testing. Um, and really what you're getting at is what users are doing and why they're doing it, which is uh, really, really um, useful information to have when you're progressing design work. On the flip side, when you were talking about the unmoderated um, type of testing, um, Obviously, the moderator is not there anymore, so it's not going to involve any conversation between the researcher and the participant. In place of that, what you're going to do is set up test sessions where you're using online tools and services to collect information automatically. So you will um, give people access to the website prototype you're using, give them a set of uh, tasks or scenarios they're going to have to work their way through, and then you gather all that data once the uh, the research is finished and analyze it um, separately. So this is, again, typically more aligned with a quantitative type of research aimed at producing specific questions. For example, what percentage of participants can successfully log in or how long does it take for participants to find a particular product? And again, this is really good at um, getting more statistical confidence in data. So it's kind of a halfway house between sort of moderated research and, and pure sort of A-B testing because with the unmoderated um, research um, sessions, you can ask particular questions through these, um, these online research tools. So um, I will now pass over to Amy to talk us through diary studies. Brilliant. So I just wanted to share a bit about um, another technique that can be used, which is diary studies. So essentially, these are where we get participants to record different events, feelings, different interactions um, in a diary that we supply them with. We can do that digitally, and we've got a platform that we use to do that, which enables people to um, upload these different interactions and capture these different moments using an app on their um, phone or tablet. Although sometimes we will still use paper um, for that if we feel that's the best thing to do, and we can send that out in the post. Um, and diary studies are fantastic for um, exploring different services and products where people's interaction with them happens over a number of days, weeks or even months um, because they enable you to capture that data over that longer period of time which might be difficult for you to capture in other ways for example uh, a lab-based session or a remote sort of hour-long um, usability test and also of course in, in current times as well it enables us to get a much wider geographical spread within one study and of course, you're also not having so much influence over participants because you're not observing their behaviour and you're not sort of looking over their shoulder um, or, and you're not screen sharing at the moment that they're, um, they're, they're carrying out those different interactions. But what we do do, um, particularly through this platform, is that it enables us to be able to moderate live. So let me just show you an example. You can see here some of the different things that people might upload. This is from a recent diary study that we conducted for um, a communications client, a national communications client. We had 25 different participants who took part in this study across 15 different households. And they were we were looking at their experience over seven consecutive days. And um, with this particular platform, we were able to moderate what they were uploading between seven o'clock and midnight each day. So they could upload things whenever they wanted, 24-7. Um, but there were a team of us taking shifts between seven and midnight and we were actually observing what it was that they were uploading. And that meant that in the time when they uploaded something, we could ask them an additional question to get some deeper insight from them. So if they'd uploaded a photo, for example, and we couldn't quite see what it was that they were trying to trying to share, we could ask them to upload another. Or maybe if they told us a particular frustration they had or they told us what they were doing, we could then ask some follow up questions about why they were doing that, and why they were frustrated. So over the course of the week, we had over 1600 data point uploads from these participants, which is fantastic. Um, and we had over 700 interactions on those. So that was the back and forth of us being able to ask additional questions. Something else that we can do as part of these studies is to set particular tasks. So we were interested in exploring some particular elements of this um, digital service for this client. So we asked participants to conduct various different tasks 
um, on the different days and they could then share um, we got them to share little videos we got them to share photos of what they'd been up to um, and something else that we got them to do as well was to capture what everybody was doing at the same time of day so obviously with 25 participants they were all uploading their different interactions at different times of day but actually it was really helpful to know what is everybody doing at eight o'clock in the morning what is everybody doing at nine o'clock at night so we could send out a notification to them through this um, system and it would ask them all to tell us what they were doing at that time and that was really useful as well so we took all of this data, we analysed it all, and we looked at it through a few different lenses. So we looked at behavioural patterns, um, we looked at timelines of people's days, we compared across the different household types. So we had um, some households that had younger children, some had older children, we had a mixture of singles, younger uh, retirees, couples, etc. And we were able to analyse all of that, follow up with some debrief telephone interviews with participants so that we could dig further into what we'd uncovered. And that enabled us to present back some really actionable recommendations to our client, um, giving them some, some opportunities that they were maybe missing at the moment and some opportunities to improve the current service as well. I'm going to hand over to John. He's going to talk about. Oh, yeah, I'm going to briefly talk about expert evaluations. It's a different type of evidence, and I appreciate it's not uh, it's not directly from the user, but it's based on user needs. Um, if you've been to our seminars before, you'll be familiar with uh, with this pyramid, uh, which basically presents the different levels of design, going from um, you know creating initial desire for a product so that so that your uh, customer might do that thing with you. Uh, going on to provide the um, the infrastructure, so making it accessible and usable uh, in the in the broader sense uh, at the next layer, uh, so that they can do that thing with you, but they don't necessarily will do what you want them to do, and then adding on those other components of user experience, such as persuasion and also emotional design as well. And really, you know, you need all of those things uh, within or to be considered within uh, a uh, interactive system, be it a product or a service. Uh, in order to make uh, something really uh, engage with a customer and you know get them to uh, press the now uh, buy now button if that's what you're doing, um, the useful thing about considering all those different stages um, and a useful thing to appreciate is there are principles that govern the kind of basics of all of those. So it's not just kind of hand wavy design stuff. Um, there are fundamental principles that determine things like uh, usability. So design principles from Donald Norman you know, back in the day, uh, Schneiderman, uh, Nielsen and Mollock about usability principles. Um, and there's also principles come from um, what I studied academically. So uh, vision uh, and perception and those types of things as well. So being able to assess um, all of those and, and and find where they're either missing or where they can be improved uh, is a useful uh, endeavor to improve the, uh, the interaction. Similarly, with persuasion and emotion, there's science behind all of those as well and the principles. So those come from behavioral economics and uh, you know, social psychology, psychology, etc. So um, evaluations, really, an expert evaluation seeks to um, apply or, or look at those known principles and assess where they're being adhered to or where they're being violated such that you can catch uh, or predict what the effect on your overall user would be. So it's a form of kind of objective evidence using those principles as the um, the kind of beacon of objectivity, if you like. Um, I'm not going to go into any more detail uh, to here because uh, I want to get onto the questions. But um, the way you generally do them is with three uh, three experts who uh, all assess things independently and then come together to uh, to write a single report. That's the generalized uh, kind of best practice way of, of doing those types of things. Okay, uh, we're just going to pass back over to Amy to talk briefly about uh, remote workshops. Fantastic, okay, so just before I do that, I'd like us to, to have a little stretch. If you've got some water next to you, just have a little sip. So this is best practice apparently, isn't it, Amy? <laughs> yeah, take a look out the window, give yourself a little screen break. Brilliant, okay, we'll carry on. So obviously we're not gonna be in rooms like this for a little while, um, but that doesn't mean that collaboration should stop. 
collaboration is absolutely essential to the human-centered design process and actually for us as human beings we need to build those social connections um, between us to help us build trust and to help us to be able to innovate so it's going to look different to this remote collaboration does have some different considerations and we need to be creative but i just wanted to share in this this final part before we move on to q a um, some tips some of the things that we're doing um, and some things to hopefully help you so let's zoom it's become the new the new verb it used to be let's facetime it used to be let's skype but it's now let's zoom and zoom really was already our tool of choice when we were conducting remote sessions prior to the whole covid19 situation um, but our fantastic it team did another review of all the available tools um, just as john said before um, everything went into lockdown and actually found that zoom is still our tool of choice um, it's very robust it's got lots of different um, functionality that's really useful and I'll talk about some of that in a minute. Sometimes occasionally we will use other specialist software um, particularly for some types of usability testing um, but it really makes sense to use a tool that more and more people are becoming familiar with. Lots of people have already got Zoom installed um, and it's, it's really helpful for that. In terms of workshops we've got waiting room functionality, you've got breakout groups, you've got all sorts of host controls that enable you to really um, facilitate those sessions really well. And what we really like to do as well is to use the combined power of Miro and Zoom together to um, conduct these workshops. So for those who aren't familiar with it, Miro is essentially like an infinite digital whiteboard that's got lots of different features to support collaboration. You can use um, all sorts of different templates in there, little um, digital post-it notes. And it's essentially like a space that people can collaborate in. Um, we have taken all of our different um, activities and exercises that we would do in our usual face-to-face -face workshops and we've adapted them into templates that we use now within our online workshops um, so we've got all of that as a suite of tools ready to go um, and, and we've used them successfully so far so combining this with zoom enables us to actually break people out into groups so it could be pairs it could be groups of four or five etc and actually for you as a, a facilitator you can jump into those different breakout rooms or sort of sub calls if you like to be able to facilitate discussion in there um, you can keep the groups the same through the whole session you can mix things up um, and the fantastic thing as well about Miro is that you can output whatever was created after the session so whereas before we would have gone around and taken photos of things on the walls we can now produce a pdf at the end and you can see here an example of some recent um, experience maps that um, some of my attendees created in a recent workshop that I ran so just to give you some very practical tips about how to do some of this stuff. Technology, obviously, it's really, really important to test your tech setup beforehand. Make sure everybody's got access to all the different tools that you need them to. Ideally, you'd run a short session beforehand um, just to make sure that everybody has got access. And then during the session, do some warm up exercises to help people get to grips with that technology in a laid back way. Um, so some sort of warm up can be really useful. And also with something like Miro, for people who haven't used it before, there's a lot of functionality that it has and it could be quite overwhelming. So don't try and tell them everything about the tool that you're using. Just introduce them to um, the bits that are needed to, to conduct the activity that you're trying to get them to do that generally tends to work well. We've all seen this picture before lots of times now, um, but in this new season, it is really important to empathize with your attendees more so than ever. People are juggling lots of stuff. People are homeschooling, they're concerned over family's health. You know, everybody's adjusting to new routines. There are physical and mental strains that people are under, and that's gonna mean that people are more tired. It's gonna mean that people get screen fatigue more quickly. So make sure that you're building in plenty of breaks Oh, we've lost our slides. Plenty of breaks so that people can um, go off and get a coffee and they know how to structure their day and plan around that. I don't know if our slides are coming back. There they are. Fantastic. Um, so, yeah, set out a schedule of time so that they can plan for that. And also with remote sessions, things just take longer. Things like muting and unmuting, um, sharing back and the slight pauses between conversation. It all adds up. So plan for that. Don't pack your schedule too full. Um, so you can make sure that you stay focused in that session and keep people engaged as well. Get everyone to put their webcams on, get everyone to stay muted unless they're speaking and set out some rules for how you want people to engage. So like we did at the start today, we talked about the Q&A panel, things like that. Um, also using real sort of visual clues. 
can, can be quite helpful. So you can see here I asked everybody a question which had a yes, no answer and they got them to hold a thumbs up or a thumbs down to the screen. And you can obviously see the people that didn't have their webcams on wasn't helpful for me as a, as a facilitator because I couldn't see what they were answering. And I was having to rely on trying to guess whether they're saying yes or no. So keep things visual. Keep things short, keep things simple, keep things focused. Don't add unnecessary stuff into your session. Make sure everybody knows why you're there, what you're trying to achieve so that you stay on track. And one other little tip is to try and play some background music when you're, uh, you've got times of silence when people are working on things individually. It can be a bit more awkward and somehow silence on a conference call uh, can feel even more silent than when you're in person. So just put some music on in the background and it can help people to stay engaged and it can remove some of that awkwardness. So those are our top tips really. And I think we're now gonna move on to some Q&A. Great stuff. So if I can ask uh, Hayley to, uh, to join us. Um, sometimes on this system, uh, it takes a little time for the, uh, the technology to work. So whilst Hayley is coming online, I will uh, answer one of these questions. So um, are there any additional GDPR issues that we should be aware of around remote testing? Um, as long as the uh, the system that you're using is secure, and, and most of the uh, the big online providers now will be happy to provide you with details of that. And indeed, often when working with clients, it's an initial um, it's an initial requirement to do that. Um, the, um, the the way that you can uh, ensure consent, and in fact, we we've, we've moved to this even for our face to face now, is get people to um, uh, consent to an online form. Um, and that is a valid um, form of consent as well, which is uh, GDPR uh, compliant. Um, other things you might want to be aware of for, for um, you know, privacy issues is kind of the things that you'd normally do anyway. Um, you know, be very careful about um, recording issues, particularly when people are using their financial instruments. Um, perhaps get them to only use first name, last name, those kind of things. So there's often a balance about trying to uh, make sure that the testing is realistic whilst also protecting um, privacy. So ultimately, we want to create um, the best of both worlds, so the most realistic uh, situation, but also protecting uh, privacy as well. But the technical issues shouldn't be uh, an issue as long as you uh, make sure you get the appropriate consent. Um, if you uh, have a recruitment firm, um, getting your uh, participants for you, they should uh, handle all of that um, for you. Great, I can see that um, that Haley's uh, here. Hopefully, we can hear you as well, Haley. Hello. Hopefully, you can. Hey, fantastic. The technology is working. So that's always one thing to be uh, aware of. Um, technology, um, you know, can be flaky, even if you've tried things out beforehand. So um, uh, to be able to cope with those things is good. We had a bit of an issue. Uh, to begin with, but that, that's all sorted now, which is great. Um, Hayley, just wanted to um, to ask you, you obviously deal with lots of research nationally and internationally, uh, and obviously you've uh, you've gone into uh, a different mode for the last four or five weeks or so. Um, can you just give us your perspective on on how uh, what changes have, have occurred uh, and how remote working has uh, worked with you, impacted you, uh, et cetera, if you can share that with uh, with everyone? Yeah, so like yourself, so we use Bunnyfoot for a lot of our research. We also have an internal research um, team as well. So um, we've had to shift everything to remote, just like you guys have. Um, what we have noticed is that um, there's kind of been a drop in the UK request. And I think that's just um, a lot of other factors. So um, obviously COVID has a big effect on budgets um, and businesses and stuff. So there's a lot of um, people stopping and pausing and uh, reprioritizing and understanding what it is that they actually want to take forward. So obviously that then determines on what research they want. So we did notice like a bit of a lag there because teams just needed to just stop and assess what they were doing. Um, but um, it, it, people still want to research people still want to connect with customers and understand um, and as we put stuff in place to help with the current situation um, we need to test that as well because we don't want to put something out there that isn't good or easy to use either so um, there's still a demand um, and we are still testing but um, 
yeah, we, we have some challenges internally because we don't have a lot of the tools that we um, require. It's something that we was getting in place and weren't quite there yet. So, um, yeah, it's quite um, frustrating for some of the internal researchers, that's for sure. Yeah. I mean, we're hearing from a number of our larger clients that there's a, the, there was a certain inertia to, um, you know, particularly with financial clients, um, you know, getting uh, the IT infrastructure uh, in there to be able to use things like re remote tools. Um, but many of them have now got over that initial. <laughs> well, I've got one story from from someone. It, it, they were on the request queue. They were on the bug list or whatever for six months to get their printer sorted. Yeah, as soon as this hit, it got done the next day. You know, so the mountains that that used to be difficult to move are now by necessity getting moved. And I think that's that's right across the board. I mean, of course, with um, you know any financial organisation, there must be all sorts of security implications there, and you know it's not trivial. We we also uh, appreciate that. Um, and I think you know some of these tools can be used um, at home, maybe on home computers. Even you know, there's all sorts of different ways of, of of coping with some of those potentially as well. And that's what we've been seeing from uh, a, a number of our clients. Um, thank you very much, Hayley. We'll, we'll also open these uh, these questions out to you as well and feel feel free to uh, to comment uh, in any uh, on any of them. So um, I'm just looking at some of the, uh, the questions here. I'll just go to the top one. Um, any tips or suggestions on how you would go about testing uh, a prototype for mobile? Um, well, you can actually test, you know, a simple way of doing it. Uh, I'll, I'll take the first one. The, the simple way of doing it would be uh, you can just have a, a camera and literally, I haven't got my mobile on me. Oh, yes, I have. Um, you could test people, you know, just using their mobile. It depends whether you want them to have, you know, the freedom, the form factor, all of those kind of things. There is remote software. Um, Zoom uh, and others can also work on mobile. So you can see what they're doing on that as well. So you can have it desktop. You can have it uh, face to face. Um, I mean, on the actual device. Um, for some uh, applications, particularly when we've been working with uh, with prototypes, we found it just easier to make um, an emulation of a mobile experience. Of course, that's a decision uh, that you need to take whether the ease of doing that offsets the um, the, the non realistic nature of that. So, as with with all of these things, there's always a balance and. It's just like with with having any type of prototype, if you like. Um, it's what you put into the prototype uh, is uh, is important to answer the research questions that you're trying to answer. In the same way that the the tools, the mode of the remote research, and indeed the, the someone asked a, a question about what technology do you recommend for doing remote research. Well, it depends on what your um, your research objectives are. So you design your technology, your prototype, the materials that you're testing, you recruit the people according to your research objectives, ideally, and not because of the tool that you bought or the one tool that you have uh, or the one that you're familiar with. So um, the choice of your tool and your mode should be dependent on your ultimate research and you should organize it all around that. Um, so there's different ways of, of, of doing those. Um, we've got another one. Where would you recruit people for the interviews um pete amy do you want to answer those and i'm going to find one for, for, for Haley whilst you're answering sure so th there's a number of ways that you can recruit participants um that would be valid whether they're doing remote research or face-to-face -face research um as you mentioned there are there are a couple of methods that are just not on the table anymore so you can't do intercepts sort of testing on the street so uh if, if you go out for your one hour of exercise and you're not going to have much joy trying to find anyone to talk to. Um, but typically, if you're going to be doing interview studies or remote research um, usability tests, you could use the traditional kind of route. So we're fortunate within Bunnyfoot that we have a um, uh, field recruitment company called Bunnyfield that we work um, very closely with, um, who have a database of like 18 or thousand people to draw from. So simply you define the types of customers you want to talk to, what the characteristics are that identify those customers so you can effectively form a, a profile to recruit against. And then you could ask uh, people um, like Bunnyfield to go and find participants that match that profile. You can do that yourself. Um, you know, you can contact people on social media, things like LinkedIn, Facebook, wherever you think your users might be online um, and try and recruit them yourself. But it's um, uh, 
from personal experience, recruiting people is a very time consuming and difficult job. So if it's not your if it's not your main job, if it's something you're having to do, um, it's definitely one of those problems that's worth paying to make go away because uh, it's it's um, it's a specialist job and it's great. It's better to get the specialist on board with that. So that, that would be my, my top tip. Great. Thank you. Um, we've got one here. Have any clients been uh, non receptive to remote research? And if so, have. Uh, what have their reservations been? Uh, Haley, I don't know if you've got any internal uh, stories from your your internal clients about uh, about that when traditionally they might have done face to face. Um, no, actually, everyone's been really open to it, and I think it's because they're aware of the situation. What I would say is, if we was offering remote moderated. Um, instead of live lab testing when that was available then i do think people do prefer to have the live lab testing i think a lot of people get um a lot out of reading people's body language and the sort of small things that you can just lose a tiny bit um on remote testing um but in general no everyone's been quite um quite happy to do it remotely I think the, the problem that we have is that um, how do we have that balance once things go back to whatever normality is? Um, and then do people then turn around and say, um, then actually, why do you need the cost of a lab? So if a company has a lab um, which they run, obviously that doesn't come um, free. So will people look at it as cost savings and take away things like labs? Because they will say, well, why can't you just do it remotely? So actually that's the challenge we have. So less about people being receptive to it, but actually when it goes back to normal, still understanding the benefits of lab-based testing as well. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, in, the, in the audience have experienced kind of lab-based testing and being in the observation room, uh, you know that the person's next door or you can see them through the, through the one-way glass or whatever. Um, that gives you a certain immediacy and a certain energy, a certain momentum. Um, and certainly with our clients, we have a kind of workshop environment where we're we're looking at, um, you know, collaborating on what the implications of the research that we're seeing is and, and the insights that we're getting. And also, um, you know, collaborating on potential solutions long term, you know, quick fixes and longer term things. So there's a certain energy that you get with that lab based stuff that, but when it's separated via a screen and there's not that proximity there that you don't get that sort of energy. I know it's kind of an intangible thing, but I think it's um, it, it's really quite important. And obviously the, the body language and everything else is is uh, pretty vital too. Uh, right. Um, can the client still watch the testing live? Um, yes, they can. Thank you for your question, David. Um, we can, um, you know, most of the tools that you might use uh, you know, if you're using Zoom, for instance, you can have people who can uh, observe and those can be streamed uh, there. Obviously, there's certain privacy issues sometimes uh, involved uh, with that uh, and involved with recordings and those types of things. But yes, uh, we can open up those up to clients in the way that we uh, we also used to when we had uh, lab based testing as well. So sometimes we'd stream those uh, out there. Um, do you need to guide the participant to share their screen? Uh, or would you allow them to take control of your screen? Thanks, Darren. Uh, Amy, do you want to take sure. that one? So I think it would depend on the situation um, in terms of what you're looking to do. We've done both in the past. Um, so if we've got a prototype that is particularly locked down, we don't want to share a link with people so that they wouldn't have access to it afterwards, then we would um, share it on our screen and allow them to take control. Equally, it might be that there's something that they've got on their computer or their device that we're wanting to see um, that, that might be their example of something. So Pete, I think, mentioned earlier when we're doing interviews, if something comes up as an example of um, a, a tool that they're using and we just say, oh, could you share your screen quickly and, and show us that, then obviously we would sort of guide them through the process of how to do that. So both have their place. Um, both can be really useful. Great. Um... We've got one here. Who wants to take this? Uh, what would you suggest as a good warm up for Milo and Zoom sessions? 
Yeah, so um, the, the most basic building block of Miro really is the digital post-it note. So something that gets people familiar with creating those, with typing into them, um, can be really good. Uh, so an example might be getting them to introduce themselves at the beginning of a session. So add a post-it note with their name, add a post-it note with their favourite food or a typical sort of icebreaker activity like that. Um, you could do something where you just get people to try and post as many post-it notes as possible with things that they can see around them in the room at the moment. Um, and the, you could get them to work together then to start to affinity map those post-it notes and add um, larger post-it notes to group them and theme them. So things like that, things that are really simple, going to be quite quick to do, but just get people used to those very basic tools. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got one uh, here I'll quickly say, I'm curious why that study needed 140 participants, the one that Pete mentioned. Um, you don't necessarily need 140 participants, but when you uh, when you open out uh, the tools uh, for remote unmoderated testing, it's actually of relatively little cost to get more people, depending on how you've uh, set up the study. So on this one, um, it was uh, a targeted checkout system. And what we were measuring was um, uh, effective, effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction. Um, and we could uh, codify those really quite easily. And therefore, um, you know, gathering extra numbers was, was no um, you know, project cost. So the more, the merrier. Um, we actually, um, we weren't anticipating getting 140, but we got that many responses uh, from our database that, that, that took part in the study. So that was good. Um, there is actually a, a, a word of caution about numbers. Oh, by the way, typically to get a reasonable estimation of something relatively locked down, you need about 30 people. So we used to do lots of quantitative eye tracking studies, for instance. And in order to get decent hotspots, you need about 30 people. Similarly, for some relatively straightforward interaction, if you're measuring the time or whatever, to get you know, reasonably robust uh, numbers, you need about 30 people. Um, that doesn't give you scientific level. I used to be a scientist. You need more for that. And there's all sorts of equations you can fill out to, to, to work out what your 95% confidence limits would be and therefore how many participants you need. So participant numbers is a, is a really good and question, uh, you know, a, a massive topic we could spend a whole hour talking about. Um, yeah, the word of warning was, um, this was ages ago, but it was during the Olympics. We did some of the early work on some of the Olympics, um, testing on some of the Olympics interfaces. And um, we opened it out and the <clears throat> Olympic committee sent out a link to uh, their database. And we had thousands and thousands and thousands of responses. And unfortunately we were on a pay per response um, mode with loop 11. It, that was the technology that we were using at the time. Um, which would have cost us and the client an absolute fortune because we hadn't, we'd forgotten to cap it because we were new to using that technology at the time. Luckily, Loop 11 really liked it because um, they used it as a, as a case study. So they, uh, they didn't charge us for all those extra responses, which was, uh, which was really useful. Um, I can see that Maribel has asked uh, any online tool that you can recommend for user research. Um, there's lots. And as I mentioned earlier, um, you should really pick the uh, the tool according to um, uh, according to your needs. Um, so I've mentioned Loop Eleven. There's things like user testing. There's uh, back in the day what users do, and there's various other and there's more coming out. Um, what we'll do probably as a follow up to this, we'll provide you a link to a um, um, a listing and a kind of pros and cons of a number of the online tools, so uh, you can see what the pros and cons of those are rather than going into them. Um, today. Um, we've got one here that um, I'm also going to ask uh, Hayley. Are there any additional considerations when conducting remote sessions internationally? So how does it work and what's your experience of translators, for example? Um, yes, so actually, um, I think uh, they're doing right now, actually, we have one running in Mexico. And um, the way that they decided to run it was to actually just have the testing happening um, as remote testing, and then they were going to translate the recording. Now, what I would say is that um, going forward, I think it would be good if in some way, um, which I think can be done, is that 
the research happens um, and you have a separate audio line that people can dial into where a translator can give the translation. Because um, I, I think that would be a lot quicker if, if the time zones work that people can dial in um, and listen live. But because it's Mexico, actually, they could only probably do that with one or two sessions anyway. So they're doing a translation of the recording. What I would say is that obviously does make a delay of a couple of days. So you've got to factor in as well um, the speed of which people need the report for the outcomes. Because um, if they do, if they do need it at a, at a speed, you've got to you've got to consider that on what option you choose. Whether you have it, you know, translated later or you have it translated live. So I think there's a number of factors: time zones, um, speed of output. But I think they're the two main ways of doing it is just to be translated after or to be translated like simultaneously on a, a different audio line. But you guys might have other options as well. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, th thank you. Yeah, we, we use a variety of, uh, of different ways of doing it. Simultaneous translation can have its uh, can have its own issues as well. And, and, and indeed, we could probably do an hour's worth on on international uh, testing and, and the different ways of doing that. Um, that's possibly a topic for a, for a future one. Uh, we've got a couple here. What uh, tool would you recommend for conducting remote diary studies? I'd also like to know the name of the tool for conducting remote diary studies. So I guess we should tell you the tool that we use for remote diary studies. There are actually several uh, about. Uh, the one that we've been favoring recently is a tool called Indimo. Um, it has various pluses and minuses. Uh, there are some other um, technologies as well. I think we've even got a blog post uh, on this that, that, that shows more of those. Um, effectively, uh, the tool that we're using at the moment, we like it for the live um, feedback that we can get. As, as Amy mentioned, uh, we can probe for certain things that we see when we're moderating that um, uh, throughout the day and, and often in, into the evening. Um, and it also for clients, it gives a nice uh, kind of dashboard approach and it's quite good for, for videos. And we do things like create um, uh, highlight videos from from the videos that people upload. So it's quite an efficient system for that. It's still got some drawbacks as well, um, but it's it's fairly good for uh, for that. Um, ooh, let's have a look. We're kind of running out of time. In fact, we're just a bit over time. So. Um, We've got some, I guess you, we've got a comment here. I guess you should ensure that participants turn off notifications for emails, et cetera, if you're recording their screen. Yep, that's one certainly for um, uh, for privacy and just, uh, you know, people being comfortable there. Um, is there any kind of testing that you can't do remotely? Uh, how would you test things like TV interfaces or physical devices, uh, for example? Um, I think you have to be, quite inventive about different ways of testing different things. Um, there's no kind of one, uh, you know, one solution to this. Um, so in one that we've recently done, which was uh, something that we couldn't simulate online and we couldn't make a, an emulator, um, we had to effectively create a demonstrator and um, take people through it that way. But by the, the way that we asked their questions, it was simulating a usability test. So we're making the, uh, the best of, of that situation. And actually the results that we got from that were, were, were very good. So um, I guess the answer to that is uh, being inventive um, and using the, the tools in the best way that you can. I mean, I'm not a big fan. I mean, lots of people think quite often they, they have um, things like focus groups and they demonstrate a product and then they ask people their opinions on it and they call that research. That isn't research. Um, so you don't want to fall into the trap of doing a product demo and then getting people to say how good it was. Um, but there are you know, ways of doing uh, good research that way by demonstrating certain, um, certain facets of, uh, of an experience. Um, I think we'll just take this last one because we're running out of time. Um, and one of the things that um, you should always do when you're, when you're uh, having remote sessions is try to stick to time as much as possible. So that's what we're going to do. Um, out of interest, are you seeing any change in the number of participants either not turning up for sessions or dropping out of diary studies since, since the lockdown began? Um, I think one of the things that we've seen actually is that people are more ready to engage in that type of research because they're at home and some of them are bored. 
Um, we've got to weigh that up with the interpretations of the, the data that they're giving us, but the, there's increased variability. Um, there's this other one here. Actually, that's all I was meant to read. Have you seen any unusual findings uh, with the diary studies pre-lockdown compared to now in terms of habits and people's behaviour? Um, anyone got any perspectives on that? I think it's early days yet from my perspective. Um, what we have seen is... Um, you know, people's, as I mentioned before, people's readiness to engage with, with online uh, services a lot more now. People becoming more familiar with doing what we're doing now rather than doing face-to-face. -face. And how that's going to translate into the future is unknown. You know, I looked at some reports um, earlier this week that, that suggested about, uh, you know, retail behaviours are changing. Uh, I think Google are doing a seminar on that um, next week. Um, and also people's attitudes towards holidays and how those are going to be effective. We're likely to have restricted international travel for you know a long time, whereas we may have domestic travel. So just people's um, you know behaviours around you know their travel and their leisure is going to change uh, dramatically as well. Whilst this is an issue, it's also um, I guess for some companies presents uh, opportunities uh, as well. So you know there are going to be big behavioural differences. I think it's too early to tell uh, at the moment. OK, um, we're coming to an end there. Thank you ever so much for, for joining us. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, Hayley, for, uh, for coming online and, and giving us your perspectives uh, as well. Um, as I said, you'll be, you'll be uh, receiving a short survey, uh, which will ask you about your experience today. But, uh, you know, this was our first one. Uh, for doing uh, a remote session. We want it to be uh, fairly short. Um, we're quite happy to take your suggestions for either lengthening these or making them more interactive so you as delegates can interact. So we can have things like, um, you know, uh, open rooms. We can have, uh, you know, one-to-one -one, uh, sessions. We can have more of kind of uh, networking amongst yourselves. At the moment, we've just done a Q&A, but we can do some more of those things. Um, for some reason, my slides keep disappearing. I don't know why. Being able to cope with technology is one of the things that you need to do in the new online world, though. So, hey, ho, I've just switched it back on. Um, if you're interested in um, uh, getting any training, uh, one of the things that we've done is um, transitioned all of our face-to-face -face courses to, uh, to remote now. Uh, and we're uh, offering a, a discount on those uh, to, uh, to all attendees and people who want to take those up. Um, these are mapped to a kind of double diamond, um, you know, design process, but effectively they're mapped to a user-centered design process. They're mainly uh, UX um, and service design and research centric. So if you want to take uh, advantage of those, please uh, do contact us. Um, oh, I did. I skipped over. I did mention that um, our next session is due to be um, on the 28th of May. Uh, it's going to be an introduction to design thinking, but do please let us know about any other topics that you want to see in the future and how you would like this to be. Oh, I can also see for some reason there's something else popped up. Um, we do have a, um, a, a participant research, um, a participant recruitment company called Bunnyfield, who um, actually, interestingly, their database has gone up uh, massively since um, the current situation has happened. I guess because more people are at home at the moment. But also we've been featured and are about to feature in Money Saving Expert as well, which has uh, increased our database massively. It's a way for people to earn. And I'm sure, I don't know what any of you guys uh, in the audience are paying your uh, participants, but typically uh, people get paid £50 for uh, an hour's session. Um, and actually it's beneficial to them at the moment because they don't have to pay for travel or expenses or any of those kind of things. So if anything, it's, it's better value for, for them at the moment. For shorter sessions, um, you know, it's typically uh, £20, £10, £20 for a 15-minute session or something like that. So um, those are the kind of uh, benefits that people can get from uh, engaging in those. Right, we're 10 minutes over, so that's Enos. Sorry for that. Um, thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, thank you very much, Hayley, for, uh, for participating uh, as well. If you have any questions uh, for us, please do uh, ask them. Get in contact with Joe, who uh, originally contacted you for this, and please do answer in uh, the survey for us. Um, and we look forward to uh, seeing you next month at the online survey and at some point face-to-face -face, uh, back in London 
uh, at some point in the future. Please, hopefully, maybe this year. So uh, thank you very much and uh, goodbye. Thanks, John. Bye.